Shalomni Państwo, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Ladies Herren, and gentlemen, im Namen der Konrad Adenauer Foundation, ich heiße Sie hier in der Villa Foxal. Ich würde like Ihnen ganz besonders herzlich die Bundesministerin der Verteidigung der Bundesrepublik Deutschland, Federal Minister of Defense of Germany, Annegret Kram Karrenbauer, Madame Minister, it is an honor and joy to have you here with us today. Und ich begrüße den Gesandten und Geschäftsträger like der Deutschen Botschaft in Warschau, Herrn Knut Abraham, also Knut Abraham sowie äh, Sie alle hier, liebe Gäste, die ich so gerne auch namentlich äh, nennen würde, I would also aber like das würde den Zeitraum introduce drängen. Personally, ich kann nur sagen, wir sind alle handverlesene, Not possible due to the time constraints. You all are security experts in the Polish civil society and you contribute a lot to our topic. And I'm very pleased that we'll have the possibility to talk and that you have arrived here in the Corona times. By the way, this is my first event uh, since May, so it's a little bit weird to see you all with masks, but I have this good feeling that we know still how to organize a conference. I'm very pleased that we'll have a discussion because we have a lot of topics to talk to, especially when it comes to security and safety. We have very fragile times all around the world, but also in the German-Polish context or looking at the transatlantic bonds. But I would not like to start now because all the questions and challenges will be named later on. For me, it is important to highlight that the area of security policy is for the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. Very important for the last 30 years, we are present here in Poland. Last November, we celebrated our anniversary. And from the very beginning, security was a very important topic for us, uh, starting with NATO, then 1990 with Poland, who supported Poland, then when it comes to their um, entrance to the European Union. We also been there and this road is still going on. We are still here in Poland. This was supported by a lot of events and thanks to this we could make the, those topics a little bit more interesting and richer in terms of content and this will happen today also. Your presence today, Ma uh, Madam Minister, is the highlight of our today's event and the highlight of our presence here in Poland. And I would not like to stop this highlight anymore and I'd like to say one thing at the very end. I'd like to thank the Kazimierz Pułaski Foundation for your great cooperation and the very good a cooperation with all the other projects that we have uh, performed together. And I'd also like to thank my cooperators, for cooperators from the CAS, and they have done really everything in order to make this meeting possible. Personally, I'd like to thank Professor Pisarska, dear Kasia, and for the last 20 years, she is very young, but she was back then in school, and for the past 20 years, she is working with us and with her Academy of European Diplomats as our long term Diplo uh, partner. She, and I'd like to highlight this when you look around, her, she made it possible that our participants, at least to 50%, are women. The CDU party talks about the introduction of the female quota. Oh, we are doing it here. We have already introduced the quota in the security and safety sector that is being called a male sector. We want to change this. We are working on this. We have a defense minister that who is a woman. Without further ado, I wish you a very fruitful evening. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Angelica. Um, Angelica. Ladies and gentlemen, let me speak in, uh, in English. Um, Madam Minister, dear friends, uh, I think I know almost everyone in this room, uh, including 
my dear wife, um, Professor Pisarska, who will be moderating uh, today's, uh, today's discussion. And uh, um, I think this is, uh, this is quite a special uh, occasion for, for, for a number of reasons. First, uh, for me, like Angelica, it's the first uh, public uh, event that we are organizing in the last couple of months. But, uh, but uh, even more, uh, we have very representative group here today with us who are representing uh, the leading uh, intellectual voices in foreign uh, policy uh, in Poland and very vivid uh, uh, civil society of Poland. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the future of the Polish international relations uh, thinking. Uh, moreover, we are very glad that uh, we are uh, having today with us a wide representation of uh, umbrella organization, Women in International Security, a Polish branch, which is, uh, which is uh, um, hosted under the wings of the Kazmierz Pulaski Foundation in, uh, in, in Poland. And, and I'm even uh, more than proud that I believe today we have at least 50-50 in the room and we were paying a lot of attention to, to keep it this way, not only during this event, but also during our uh, flagship event called the Warsaw Security Forum. And since the Warsaw Security Forum uh, future, I mean, the specific date is still, and this is a spoiler, uh, is still under, under discussion. Uh, if it will be this year or spring next year, it will be announced soon. But, uh, but this meeting is a part of the road to Warsaw Security Forum. Warsaw Security Forum, which uh, for the last six years is uh, on an annual basis gathering more than 1,500 uh, leading voices from more than 60 countries here in Warsaw, including president, uh, prime ministers, ministers, and uh, most important, uh, um, great thinkers who are contributing and advising their leaders in uh, shaping the foreign policy and security. So uh, I would like to um, warmly uh, thank uh, Angelika Klein and Adenauer Stiftung here in Poland, not only for organizing uh, today's uh, uh, session to together, but also for contribution during the Warsaw Security Forum. And we expect that the, the upcoming uh, edition of the Warsaw Security Forum will have uh, very, I think, uh, the largest from the previous, in comparison with the previous editions, a representation of German voices in discussion. Since we are neighbors, since we are very good friends, I believe that we should be proud of this uh, neighborhood relations that we were able to uh, develop in the last three decades. Um, let me invite right now to the podium, and uh, some Americans are saying, cut to the chase. So I will, I will yield the floor to, to Katarzyna, who will moderate today's session, and uh, uh, Madam Minister, I live, uh, I live in the hands of my wife. I think it's a, it's a good and secure in this un difficult times. The floor is covered. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I am. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. Can you hear me? Well, perfect. So, uh, welcome and again, welcome, Madam Minister. Uh, it's a huge pleasure for us to have you here. Uh, Madam Minister does not require much uh, introduction, but let me just say she is one of the leading German politicians serving as Minister of Defense of Germany since uh, uh, 2009. She's also the chairwoman of the Christian Democrat Union since 2018. Uh, Madam Minister has been previously a Secretary General of the party and a, Mr., uh, and a minister president of Saarland between 2011 and 2018, and she was the first woman, woman to lead the government of Saarland and the fourth woman to head a German state government. It's a huge pleasure, Madam, Secretary, uh, Madam Minister, to have you here, and we will have a discussion today with Madam Minister on the challenges for European security and defense, but we will start with a few remarks coming from our honored guest, and then we go directly into the discussion in which we hope to have as much questions and take as much questions uh, from, uh, from our uh, audience today as possible. So, Madam Minister, the floor is yours. Dear ladies and gentlemen, 
Dear representatives of the foundation, all your supporters, thank you very much for the fact that today you have come here. For many of you, this is the first public event. Uh, this applies also to me, and I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I'm very happy that we'll have a discussion. Allow me to start with a couple of introductory comments so that we have enough time for a discussion. For me, this visit in Poland and Warsaw is a very special one, not only because my Polish colleague was the first one who visited me in Berlin in August last year, but for me this is the first foreign visit since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I think that this is a very important day for the Polish history because this is the day when we experienced the creation of the Polish sovereignty and the creation did not happen on a peaceful way, it had to be fought for. And if we were to draw a line along the Polish history, is, is this is the line of history and sovereignty in Poland. This is the fact that the Poles had to fight for it every single time. And for me, it was very obvious uh, after the conversation with the Polish Minister of Defense, I laid a wreath at the tomb of the unknown uh, soldier. There's also the heap of a pile of ground from Katyn, and then I moved also to the Warsaw Uprising Museum, and I have to say that I saw a lot, I experienced and got to know a lot, and even for me, when it comes to facts, was new. But what you could feel was the fact that throughout all the time, till this uprising, the wish of the Poles to be self-sufficient, to be free, to be independent, this gave them a lot of power. And I'm saying this in the year when we think that 75 years ago the Second World War ended, then at the same time we have to remember what led to World War II. And at the beginning of World War II, what was the beginning of World War II? The beginning of World War II was the attack of Germany on Poland and all the pain that it brought with itself and the misery. So taking into consideration this background, it's very important to say that uh, when it comes to this historical responsibility, this historical uh, guilt, we are aware of this. And together with the Polish side, we do not want the history to be written new. We believe that the uh, belief in the history based on facts as it is being analyzed and experienced and we do not want a new history written of the past because it serves state objectives of course this unites us in this year we also remember a very happy moment in the german history 30 years of the reunion of Germany, and this reunion of Germany would be without John Paul II, the Pope, would be without the Solidarity Movement not possible. I, 1982, I made my maternity test, and in the time when I was in a gymnasium, I met the representatives of Solidarność as part of Lessons of History and they told us, because we were 18 years old to the, and we were the last class before the maturity exam, they told us how it was to fight for a free Poland and this, this will to be free, to be independent, at the end of the day this was the motivation, the power that the people in the uh, at times of the communist times, when Germany was divided, that those people had, because back then it was not so obvious whether they would not be the next day in a Stasi uh, jail if they were to protest. But people went and protested, and this also originated here in Poland. Hence, the question today, what is our approach to freedom and what we are able to do in order to defend this freedom, a very up-to-date question. Many of us, especially the young generation, is the one that we say, that, that they say that 
Well, freedom is something obvious, but in the last weeks, we experienced ourselves that it is possible not to have this freedom, not to be able to support, to uh, visit your family, to travel across Europe. This Corona times told us that freedom is something precious. And when it comes to security policy in Poland or in Germany, and the one that we represent together as part of the European Union and NATO, serves to protect this freedom. Hence, what I told my Polish colleague today, the security of Poland is the security of Germany and the other way around. No one fights for himself as one. We are together. And this is a very important point uh, in times when we experience that we have not reached the end of the history, meaning that at the end of the Cold War, the systemic differences have not stopped. Nowadays, we have those differences in a different way. We see them on an international basis, especially when it comes to the emerging conflict between the US on the other high, on the on the one side and China on the other side. And by the way, a view in the area of Southern Asia and the Pacific shows that freedom is nothing uh, which is given once and forever. Hence, we need a power that we can give one another only. Which brings me to the main topic, mainly the fact that we will have the presidency now in the uh, EU Council. Now, the question is how we in Europe, but also all around the world, what makes us special in Europe, how we perceive freedom, the values that we have, how those values, how the freedom can be defended. Now, it is necessary to have the basic information of our security architecture. And Poland and Germany agree with one another when it comes to the security architecture, because we think that Poland and Germany think that NATO and the transatlantic bonds, the biggest foundation of the security architecture, said you have to say openly that we do everything on a national and European level to do even more for security, you have to remember that we want to be able in Europe to replace the efforts that the US gives us now, but this will take up a lot of time. But for now, we need the transatlantic bonds and we we'll always need them. But at the same time, we need to remember that looking at the US, we see changes. For the US, it's the question about their presence in Europe. It's also about the question, how will are we dealing with such a regional power like Russia? But it would be naive to say that this is the only focus of uh, the United States of America. Because I highlighted it that the US are looking more towards China and this region of the world. And in our further neighborhood, Libya, Syria, but also the Sahel area, you see that the question whether this area is stable or not, first and foremost, touches upon European interests much more stronger than US interests. And we cannot base only on this that what was trained for many years now is the foundation for the future. Of course not. We have to think that we, as people of Europe, should be able together to act much stronger than nowadays. And this is maybe a difference towards the French point of view, not as a replacement of NATO, but as a support or supplementation of NATO as a strong EU, European basis. What does it mean for the next six months of our EU Council Presidency? First of all, I think that we need to understand strategy in the same way. We have different approaches. We have the permanent structural cooperation. We are discussing about the EU budget and for the first time the question of military mobility and defense funds is, pos is visible. We have the battle groups. We have the joint initiatives with France and Great Britain. 
but we do not have a strategic compass that would bundle all this to one strategy. And we said that we would develop this strategic compass. During our presidency, we're supposed to start this project, and this document should be finished during the EU presidency of our French colleagues in 2022. We are starting with a joint threat analysis. Because honestly speaking, when you look at Russia, then you see that there are major differences within Europe. I'll, sh I'll present you this based on an anecdote. One of my first trips was to the Baltic states, and we as the Bundeswehr, as the German army, and as part of the Enhanced Forward Presence, CFP, are present, and we have troops there as well. And regardless where I was in the Baltic state, the reaction was the same. It's very good that the German Bundeswehr is here. Please stay with us and please reinforce your presence. I came back to Germany. I had an event in Potsdam near Berlin. The first question that I was asked was, when do you withdraw the troops from Lithuania because they threatened the peace with Russia? Meaning it's a totally different perspective. Well, you know that the point of view in Spain, France is also completely different. So a joint feeling of our threat to have this feeling, this is the major uh, task for the next month, next six months. And we have a point here, I think, where the Polish point of view concerning the activity of Russia and the German point of view when it comes to the defense is very, very similar. They actually overlap. Now, when we have this strategic compass, then the question arises, what do we deduct from this? What are the threats for the future and where do we need more activity? And in connection with this, we want to be able to act, meaning that we need to have money. During the next months, it won't be a very simple discussion, neither on the national level, because all the budgets due to the coronavirus are suffering, but also on the European level, it will be very difficult, which is why I do hope that during the next European Council, we will make progress when it comes to the discussion of the European budget, the recovery fund, and I also do hope that especially with the topic of the European Defense Fund and military mobility, which is very important for Poland, will make a progress and that the approaches that have been to a certain extent limited will be highlighted and we'll be able to in uh, increase them because we need to have a leverage, meaning that there has to be national effort with European effort with NATO support. And because in the um, defense policy, I want to be very clear, there is a policy of armament and disarmament, and to a large extent this means factories that are placed here in Europe need to produce because they create jobs, new jobs, and it makes no sense for me, I think, to pay billions of euro for foreign companies when in a situation where the country can buy from a national company should do so, but this is a discussion that we'll have to have. We also at the same time have to remember that the money has to be put into good projects and when it comes to the PESCO projects, meaning the permanent structural cooperation, I think we have a very good instrument in our hand and uh, we want to use those projects so that countries which are not members of NATO can participate in this. And this is important for the NATO-EU cooperation. How are we going to do this? Whether we'll be generous or not, this is a discussion that is being conducted with the Polish party. And we will, were agreed with my Polish colleague that if there is a possibility to solve this problem, then it is throughout the next six months. And Poland and Germany should do it together, hands together we want to make a step forward and we want to find a solution together. And the third point, where we will and should and have to cooperate, is the question that, uh, taking into consideration all the equipment that we are talking nowadays, 
we cannot only freeze in the discussion and talk about what is a threat nowadays because when we look at Russia then we know that they are increasing their armaments when it comes to conventional weapons, when it comes to the newest uh, weapons systems. We have to talk about other threats like hypersonic weapons or uh, drones, and this requires a different types of uh, air protection, which is why our defense, which is why we need to focus on those new solutions if we do not want to be dependent on the systems and solutions of the US side or other countries that will propose solutions, which is why we have to merge all of these uh, ideas, and this will be one of the biggest points during our EU presidency. At the end of the day, we as Europeans will have to answer the question whether we are ready and so many people in Poland throughout the last hundred years and the last tens of years have fought for freedom, uh, to freedom inland, but also freedom to the outside. And are we ready for those uh, values? Because taking into consideration our approach to Russia, we also need to focus on China. And China is a challenge indeed, uh, because it's a huge country, and we know that without a cooperation with China on an international level, especially when it comes to human problems like climate change, we won't uh, solve those uh, problems because China is a very important economic partner for Germany, Europe, for other countries. But China is also a systemic challenge because it is the first system that shows that you can have an economic success without using such words like civil rights, freedom, individuality, or at least not to protect them as we do it in the West, or we, as we do it here in Poland. So the question that we have to answer at the end of the day is, first of all, the question, are we ready to fight in the name of our system, values, and beliefs? If yes, then the next step is also to be able to finally do it. But this debate, well, this debate has to be conducted by us together as Europeans, because every single country in Europe is too small and too weak to do it on their own. So there are a lot of elements that unite Poland and Germany. There are some topics where we have different point of view or where we argue, and this is normal among friends and neighbors in, in the EU, it is possible, and I'm happy that I can talk about all those aspects with you today in an open way, and I'm now curious to hear your questions in the discussion. Thank you. Please join us at the stage. Madam Minister, welcome to Warsaw. We are delighted to have you here as we understand this is a, a larger uh, trip that you are having in the region. Um, and my first question would be, uh, what are your impressions from today uh, in terms of speaking with uh, the Polish officials? You've met with your counterpart, the Minister uh, of Defense. Uh, what would you say are the uniting and the dividing themes of, of the discussion? And what is your message while you travel throughout the region and specifically here in Poland? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a conversation today with my colleague, the Polish uh, Minister of Defense, and as I said a moment ago, there is a large number of topics where we are unanimous, for example, when it comes to the evaluation of NATO or the transatlantic uh, relations. We know that we should support the European pillar in the NATO, not outside of NATO, but inside of NATO. And when it comes to bilateral cooperation, but also 
joint point of view that we have for joint interests that very often in the NATO and the EU and the question of security policy, we are pulling in the same direction. It was a very constructive conversation. It is a conversation concerning a topic where there are almost no differences. Some topics are, of course, controversial. I would normally talk uh, with the minister about it, but the prime minister was in the parliament. So I use the time to see personally the Warsaw Prison Museum and thankful for that. Was one of the topics that you've raised uh, also uh, about the potential withdrawal of U.S. forces from Germany? Uh, was that a topic you've, you've discussed? And also, what is your stance uh, on this, knowing that Poland has for many years been asking for the strengthening of NATO's Eastern Frank, but of course not at the expense mm -hmm. of any uh, other uh, NATO country? Uh, so uh, was, uh, was this also a topic of consideration with Poland's yeah. counterpart? Well, we spoke very openly about this today. The first thing that I would like to say about this is that the presence of the U.S. troops has to do with German security, of course. But first and foremost, it has to do with the security of the whole of NATO, and it also has to do with the U.S. security. Because if you look at the main locations in Germany, or lunch tool or the great military hospital where all US soldiers are being put when they're being injured before being sent to the States. When I look at Rammstein, which is the logistic platform for all the actions of Americans and Afghanistan or other places, we have a very good shooting range also. So their presence in Germany serves also the US. A Polish colleague and I were really unanimous today that it's actually a question that concerns NATO. And for both of us, and we were unanimous, that the worst case scenario is when the Americans withdraw the troops not only from Germany but from Europe. Which is why the first thing that where we have a joint interest is that those troops stay in Europe because uh, this is a clear sign of the transatlantic commitment. Where they will be placed, well, this is a decision that the US side has to do in a sovereign way. And uh, together with the US colleagues, we're talking about this. Again, I'd like to highlight and uh, I thank the Polish side for this, namely that on all levels the Polish colleagues have always said that they want more U.S. presence, but not at cost of the withdrawal of those troops from one from any country, which is why it is a question of our bilateral relations, but not so much, meaning that regardless what the Americans do, it will have an influence on the Russians. Uh, this will not harm, of course, the uh, U.S. Uh, NATO ground charter. Uh, of course not. Uh, we will see next week how the details will look like, because probably next week the Pentagon will present the plans in the Congress, and then we'll have a real know what the support will look like. You've actually used this argument of the EU-Russia Founding Act as a potential obstacle to more American presence or NATO presence actually uh, in Central Europe, not only in Poland. But uh, the Act uh, talks also uh, about the changing conditions. So in the current conditions when it was signed, uh, it seemed uh, uh, valid. But today these conditions have changed because of Russia breaking uh, actually much of the uh, much of the rules of the game established in this act by the annexation of Crimea in 2019. Do you really think that the EU-Russia founding act should uh, stop us, deter us from strengthening the eastern flank of NATO? Um, the well, the first point, again, I'd like to highlight that... Um, 
this it's is the, not this about is what the, uh, what the Russians feel and with a decision, uh, but uh, it's mainly about showing presence in Europe. The EU-Russia founding act was created in a time where the relations were completely different, and starting from that time on, especially in the recent past, we know that uh, this founding act was violated by Russia. But up to now, it was a clear commitment within NATO that you do not react to the breach in the same way. When they go low, we go high, meaning that we are on a completely different moral level, which is why we keep or strictly uh, we strictly follow this founding act. Very often the terms that are specified there are not detailed de described in detail. Uh, if US troops are withdrawn from Germany from to Poland and the Russians say that it's a breach of the uh, founding act, okay, I understand this, but we have to stick to the rule that not every single action of the Russian uh, side has to be responded with the same measures because uh, it did us well to do so, so we have to be very cautious. Absolutely. Thank you for this. Now, Germany has just taken over the EU uh, presidency. You've mentioned in your speech a number of, uh, of, of policies, of areas of interest, especially from the European defense and security uh, perspective. Uh, but uh, how do you think you know, that the concept of European strategic autonomy will, uh, will develop? You talked about unity between NATO and the European Union, but it seems that some countries uh, do not fully uh, um, feel uh, they feel that Europe should have a strategic autonomy uh, are you worried that that such a strategic autonomy could uh, lead to weakening of, of NATO um, well, this is a discussion that uh, we have to conduct in a very serious way, and as part of the strategic compass, we'll have to define and have a debate what we understand as a European autonomy. Now, for me, and this connects me with my Polish colleague, is that we understand the European possibility to act which is or has to be adjusted to NATO. For others in Europe, it is an autonomy from NATO, not with NATO. Parallel to the debate about the strategic compass in NATO, we also have a process ongoing in order to once again think about this, how the NATO will, how NATO will be prepared for future. And both processes have to be seen together. And I would be in favor of this, and I'm very happy that I have such partners like Poland that we can say yes. Also, there will be situations where European and American interests will clash, and we will be more challenged than the Americans, and then we'll be, we have to be able to follow our interests, but it can never be a competition between the EU on the one hand and NATO on the other. Thank you very much. I will now move uh, into the questions directly uh, to our uh, wonderful audience. Uh, we have uh, been promised to have at least half an hour, so we will uh, we will use the next half an hour for the question and answers. Are there any first questions? I'm sure there are, but it's always hard to give, ask the first first question. Who wants to start? All friends here. Uh, I think there is a yes. Yes, please. And in the back, I see uh, Beata Gurka Winter, please. And then Michal Baranowski. Thank you very much. Bata Gurka, Winter Center for Europe, uh, Warsaw University. My question will be about uh, research and development. Uh, the last message from your commission is that uh, funds for mm -hmm. Horizon 2020 will be, will be cut. Uh, by 5 billion, if uh, I'm not mistaken, 5 billion euros, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, my question is, isn't it a contradiction to what the EU declares about uh, um, uh, European security? We won't have modern security and modern European capabilities without research and development and without uh, providing funds for research and development. 
So how we can explain the smooth? Mm. This is in the well, part. Indeed, uh, it's difficult to, to understand, but you, had, you would have to think about it in the context of the debate on the European budget altogether. The European budget in its maximum uh, um, amount is discussed upon now. It will be discussed during the weekend. In order to prepare any compromise, from my point of view, uh, in all the areas that funds have been cut, Hence, during the weekend, two questions will be important. First of all, whether the total budget will be increased or not, and if yes, then when will, where will we see more investments? We, as representatives of the security policy, are interested in more military mobility, but at the same time, I'd like to highlight it, that we are interested also in R&D. And on the one hand, especially when it comes to civilian problems, programs, Horizon 2020 is important, but it's also a question how the possibilities of the new agency for cyberspace for armaments will be used. And in this case, we are in contact with the present commissioner that uh, we need more money in the uh, EU military budget. The second uh, question is to what extent to the current European budget, we will base on the Merkel-Macron plan, so the recovery plan, because it should serve a situation where, despite the difficult economical situation, especially in the national budgets, that we can invest in future. And also this question will be important during the weekend, and I do hope that we will come to a joint conclusion so that we can jump to work. But at the same time, I do not exclude that during the weekend we will not reach an agreement. Thank you very much. Uh, Michal Baranowski from the uh, German Marshall Fund uh, Warsaw office. Thank you very much. We're also <coughs> disinfecting those microphones. Yes, no, as I'm. Uh, yes. <laughs> so feel, don't be afraid. I feel safe. very disinfected. Uh, it's wonderful to have you with us, uh, Madam Minister, and congratulations to the organizers. Fantastic to have this discussion. Um, if I can sneak in two questions. Um, my first question is about um, your personal role and, and also the uh, political role and political line you have been playing in, in uh, emphasizing the Munich consensus for Germany need, needing to do more on uh, defense and security. Uh, you have one, you've been one of the most outspoken voices on this. If you could uh, help us understand where Germany is on this, on this debate, what are the main obstacles uh, and maybe issues that help you in your achieving this, this goal of stronger uh, defense and security uh, in Germany. My second question is about um, transatlantic relations. So we are obviously facing all uh, elections in November. Uh, it's going to be either Donald Trump or um, Vice President Biden. Um, my question is if you could help us understand the potential impact uh, that this decision could have on Germany's thinking when it comes to European strategic autonomy, when it comes to NATO, um, uh, when it comes to strengthening the European pillar within NATO. Um, I don't mean it as a hypothetical. I know it's not good for a politician to answer hypothet hypothetical questions, but you must be thinking about the future as well. Mm -hmm. So how do we navigate this? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much for those interesting questions. Well, I'd like to answer the first question as follows. First of all, there is no difference between my personal approach and my, let's say, political approach, because what I represent is my belief. Uh, let's make a step back in order to understand from which point of view Germany has started. 
I think that it's that what the first NATO Sec Gen has said was very important. He was asked, "What is NATO good for?" The Sec Gen said, "He's good. The NATO is good because the Russians are out, the Americans are in, and the Germans are low." This is what he said, and in Germany there was this approach that economically we are a power, but not when it comes to the military, and the military were not a power. And then we had the German reunion, then we had the end of the Cold War, and we had the feeling that we are on the great side because we are surrounded by friends and we are not threatened anymore. This again led to a situation that throughout many years uh, we have decreased new capabilities of the Bundeswehr up to 2014, when we witnessed the Crimea annexation, when we witnessed the aggression in Eastern Ukraine, and NATO said, listen, international actions against terrorism are very important, we have to consider it as well. Please think about this. From this time, the Federal Republic of Germany agreed to NATO, saying that up to 2030 we'll be able to present 10% of the military NATO capabilities. So this is 2% of GDP for military purposes, and we are working on this. Every single year there is a fight with the Minister of Finance, with the Parliament, but we have managed it so far. It's going to be much more difficult now, on one side. Easier if the GDP goes down, then you have much quicker 2%, but this does not mean that you have more money, which is why we need to increase the capabilities. In addition to that, the Bundeswehr is a parliament's army, meaning that every single action of the German Bundeswehr has to be confirmed by the parliament. Well, um, first of all, this is a very good institution because there are uh, because soldiers have this support, meaning that the parliament will support them always. But it's a very long pr process. It's very difficult to explain to the French colleagues that they can do military action quicker because the president can decide. We have to spend three months to debate it in the German Bundestag. It's not that easy. Now a big challenge is ahead of us, meaning that on the one side, very practically have to put the Bundeswehr in a situation where it plays to its role in NATO, meaning that we are ongoing a huge modernization armaments offensive. Not everything goes well, not everything goes according to plan as we wished for. Hence, at the very beginning of this year, oh, I started a new initiative so that it's quicker and more efficient, but at the same time, uh, we need to have a debate in the German society, and the German society needs to be told uh, that it is an expectation of our friends towards Germany when it comes to our responsibility. We are able and we are ready to take this responsibility. We have shown this to over 20 years being now in Afghanistan. Over 50 soldiers have died in Afghanistan, German soldiers. M many more were wounded. We are a framework nation in the north. We can do it, we are ready to do it, but it's a debate which for the German public opinion is not that easy, which is why it is so important taking into consideration all the security conferences, all the Munich security conferences that were there, every single time to highlight and to show what is the main goal in order to increase our capabilities. These are the main two fields that I'm focused on. And this again has to do with the transatlantic relations and the perception of the U.S. side. And it's not a um, mystery that uh, the former U.S. president had had much more supporters in Germany than uh, the current president. Hence, some discussions are not that easy. But my task is to tell the German public opinion that. We want to spend 2% GDP on military, not because the US president demands it. And by the way, Donald Trump was not the first, because Obama and Bush said the same. But this is our own, in our own interest, we have to highlight it every single time. And if now we look at the um, 
uh, presidential election. And when we think that there would be a change, then this will be a change in the way of communication for sure. But there will be also a change in many strategic goals. And I think that there will be not that huge differences because the perception of China as a systemic competitor and as a threat seems to me in the US policy to be perceived in the very same way by the Republicans and the Democrats as well. The role of Russia, I think it's also not the viewpoint of the White House, because the Senate, the Congress are even, I think, more critical tower towards Russia than the White House. Hence, I think there will be some things that won't change, but also such some small changes that will maintain, even if the president changes, but the communication will be different. Excellent. Well, we have now seven questions, so uh, could we take them by twos? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with the, uh, Łukasz Kulesa, who is the deputy director of the Polish Institute uh, of International Affairs. Uh, and then I will go to Marcin Burzański, who was next, and then Małgosia, and then we'll follow in this part uh, of the room. So let's take it by two. Łukasz, please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Minister, thank you very much for finding time uh, for us. Uh, I would like to bring us back to the uh, bilateral uh, Polish-German uh, agenda. Uh, and I'm uh, maybe not disappointed, but a, a little bit concerned that uh, our cooperation doesn't really have uh, any flagship projects or ideas that would put additional impetus uh, to our cooperation. When I look at German-French, uh, relations, there is a number of initiatives, including in the armament sector. I look at your other partners, uh, there are cooperations in deployments, in missions. Uh, there is also cooperation unit to unit in framework nation concept. Uh, but it seems that there is not enough uh, concrete, uh, specific uh, substance uh, in our bilateral relationship. So I'm wondering if Today, you have discussed uh, with Minister Błaszczak any such ideas or initiatives that uh, could put this cooperation forward. And if not, if you yourself uh, have any ideas of what could be uh, our flagship projects. Thank you very much. And if you don't mind, we'll take a second mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Martin Pozański, please. Thank you very much. It's a beautifully safe, uh, <laughs> uh, Madam, uh, Madam Minister. Sterile. Uh, uh, yes, sterile. A uh, pleasure to have you here. Uh, if you don't mind, two very short questions. First one, uh, what is your approach, what is your plan with dealing with Turkey being a uh, problematic, to say the least, uh, a partner in NATO, but the second biggest army with all of the consequences of its current behavior for the whole southern flank and the whole uh, European security sphere? And this is one, one question. Uh, the second one, um, presumably a difficult one, but important one to raise in terms of Polish-German relations and the joint threat assessments that you mentioned. There's a very wide consensus in Poland among all of the experts from left to right that uh, using energy as a weapon is a major challenge. And we have a very, very big issue with understanding mm -hmm. how in that partnership um, the plan to support, continue supporting Nord Stream 2 um, mm -hmm. uh, and the overall policy of, of Russia of using gas as, as mm -hmm. weapon is uh, is in sort of, sort of planned in your in your policy. So we'd love to hear your opinions about reaching some kind of consensus uh, and mm -hmm. common understanding around that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Excellent. Yeah. Huge questions. No, yeah. <laughs> Very interesting questions. Um, uh, the, uh, so when it comes to the first question concerning bilateral relations, I do share. And I do not share 100% your point of view because we have very good bilateral relations. We are cooperating very close together when it comes to the multinational core in Szczecin. And there are a lot of also points where we support one another strongly. Now, when I talk to my colleagues from Saxon or other German uh, regions, they are hugely interested in border projects for the German and Polish army to cooperate even closer than it used to be in the past. Now, I can also think of many other projects, ideas, and one concrete project that we talk about today. 
also from the Polish side, it is a wish on the table being the development of the main ground battle tank, so also the main ground command system, MGCS. You know that we are working on the main battle tank of the future, we are working on the main airplane of the future. Uh, when it comes to the FCAS, this project is open for the Fifth European Partner for Spain. And today we talked also about this and um, I supported this as well, that it would be the approach from Germany that the MGCS, Main Ground Combat System, should be open for Europe or for a European um, input. And my Polish colleague made the proposition it could be done as part of the PESCO project. And of course, here are some joint interests uh, interest because the question of the land defense of the tanks in Poland uh, has to do with another need than with in other EU countries. So this is what we talk about also in detail. Uh, it, it's not an easy discussion. It won't be a swift discussion, but it is a discussion that I would strongly support, especially when we could involve our partners in Central Eastern Europe. And I think that this would be a huge project also in the perspective of the threats of the future. The same applies to the air defense. The air defense of the future will be different than the one that we have today. Day. And when we look who is in the reach of conventional Russian weapons, that these are the North European countries, the Baltic country, countries, the Central Eastern European countries, but also a major part of Germany, which is why we have joint interests. And I'm convinced that when it comes to those developments concerning the systems of the future, it's not everyone for himself because we don't have the power, we need to do it together. Mainly, this is a field of future cooperation where we can work better. When it comes to Turkey, you described it correctly. The, I mean, Turkey is a very difficult partner in NATO. On the one side, they are together with us and they are a trustworthy partner because they contribute to our burdens, but at the same time, they are, they are a strategic important partner. During the last days in Brussels and also in NATO, we had a discussion about the situation in and all around the Black Sea. And there are a number of very critical comments, voices and perspectives on the Russian presence and the question whether it means that at the end of the day that Russia has a free access to this sea. And one of the main actors here is, of course, Turkey, which is why we as NATO are interested in participating in that. It is also true at the same time that Turkey is a difficult partner due to its behavior in Libya. And we saw this uh, during the Irini mission. However, I still think that uh, we can push the topic a little bit forward. It's not an easy cooperation. We needed a very long time to accept the GRP plans for the eastern flank, but at the end of the day we managed to do it, which is why we need the so-called strategic patience but I think we still have a lot of challenges ahead of us and the topic of energy is also a topic that while for the time being is a um, disagreement when it comes to Turkey and Greece for example when it comes to uh, the Mediterranean Sea because they cannot reach an agreement and people ask are you team Greece or team Turkey and I know also a lot of problems concerning Nord Stream 2 and a lot of concerns and I can speak openly because it's of course not a um, mystery. It's not my favorite project and if I were there from the very beginning and also I had the responsibility then I would have never finalized it and put it forward but it is a project that has been started by um, another government and 
Nowadays, 99. I don't know, five or six percent is concluded, which is why we should not suggest that such an advanced project can be just like this cancelled. The arguments against we have to differentiate them. There are very serious concerns, especially from Poland, especially from Ukraine. Uh, these are questions where the Chancellor tries to contribute to the negotiations. But there's also a debate that we have on this with the US. There are three arguments. First of all, we make ourselves dependent or too much dependent from the Russian energy supplies. But we have to consider that, especially in the last years, we had a massive effort to diversify our own energy sources through renewable energy sources, but also through uh, liquefied natural gas and other possibilities. And uh, I think that the dependency uh, from the Russian gas is smaller. It will be, of course, smaller and smaller the more we will move forward. The second argument, with the money that is accepted, uh, the Russian military is being financed from this money. And uh, I would say that the incomes from Nord Stream 2 do not allow for a such huge armament in the Russian army as we see it now. There are also other sources of uh, money that come from different areas from other partners that are not yet criticized. And of course, we are here among friends. Of course, the debate with the US side is uh, very important. And the US are also a competitor when it comes to ga gas deliveries. And I would be very happy if in future from the we could have more from the US side. But this again means that the US gas has to be proposed for very competitive prices. And this is the situation we try to find ourselves in this situation, but also pursue our own energy policy to avoid a too big dependency on energy and get to minimize it. And we are in the best way to do so. I will now take my, the very last questions. Uh, Małgorzata Bonikowska and Leszek Jarzewski were in line. I'm sorry to all the rest. Uh, but Madam Minister promised that she will stay with us for a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, if we end on time. So we have four and a half minutes. A minute, a minute, and three minutes to answer. Right. Yes, very, oh, very short. Mongorzata yeah. Bonikowska, Center for International Relations. Just two questions, very quickly. One, one, one. Gosia, one. Uh, it's the same. It's about your lessons learned from pandemic as far as security is concerned. Cybersecurity, because everything moved online. Governments operate online, you know, the EU summits are online. So what are your lessons learned and also generally for the politicians? And China. China is also a technological superpower. How should we behave towards Two them? huge questions. And Leszek, uh, the last question from Liberté. Uh, Madam Minister, uh, how do you see the cooperation with the government that successfully uses the anti-German uh, scaremongering to uh, retain in, in power? Thank you. A political question about the political campaign in Poland. Somebody had to ask that. <laughs> um, uh, Allow me to start with the last question. We are working on different fields, very good and very pragmatic with one another. This applies first and foremost to security policy, but there are also other areas. And well, there are also major differences when it comes to the evaluation of the internal political discussion in Poland itself. And as I said previously, among friends and partners, we need to have such a debate because Europe for me is a society of values and not only a society of numbers. Whether we can live with that, that uh, we are criticized by the Polish government and the Polish government needs to live with that, that the German government might also have and present very strongly its arguments 
it's very important that we do not forget what connects us and we have to cooperate very briefly closely with one another and i'm very happy that it's possible with the current minister when it comes to covid 19 well covid 19 teaches us that we are not as resilient as we thought and suddenly things endanger our system that we have not thought so. If I were asked in January that the question whether you have a personal protection mask is part of your personal security, I would say, well, actually not. And in March, I experienced quite the contrary. And we'll have a debate, we'll have to conduct a debate how on the one side globally we maintain globally and are connected globally also economically because this is our success model and still whether european or national are independent due to the crisis and the second conclusion that i made is that we saw that it was really important to be able to act on a field which has never been foreseen as part of european cooperation crisis prevention health prevention health um, policy is national policy or used to be no one wanted to do it in europe on a multinational level now it seems that it's good that if on the european level we have had the resources or a structure, we also talked about this today, of uh, sanitary units of the military to cooperate and should it, should it be necessary if national resources are not uh, enough to use this cooperation but not use it in a propaganda way like China does. And the third point, we see also, first of all, that the digitization is very helpful in my case, in the ministry and also in my party, the last four weeks, we made a lot when it comes to introducing digitization than throughout the last years, but we also see that there are hybrid attacks, there are hacking attacks on the German Bundestag, we also see that there are fake news campaigns and we have to accept that we are not really prepared for this type of threat. We need to have a strategic compass, a threat analysis in the EU and in the NATO. And this kind of threat and also this kind of resilience is very important in those topics and it's an inclusive part which is why we have to broaden the definition of security a little bit away from the classical definition or to move towards those questions and see that there are a lot of more threats than we think that they are thank you very much madam minister thank you for for this uh, sincere open discussion uh, and uh, having the time to meet with us we're very much looking forward to having you for 15 more minutes if if possible and invite all of you together for a small networking cocktail we have a marvelous place uh, here uh, to to also discuss maybe less informally but let's start with a huge round of applause to our wonderful guest madam thank you. minister thank you oh so wonderful thank you thank you so much wonderful thank you thank you, thank you. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you.